There is still time to correct this most grievous misunderstanding, Mr. Carter. The dagger of Amman Ra must be returned to Egypt. Stay out of my way, or I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. Surely you can find a way to accommodate everybody's wishes? Who are you to tell me what I can do with my own property? Your property? What authority did you have? The authority of the Egyptian Antiquities Service. So if you don't like it, I suggest you waddle on back to Egypt and complain to your own government. Would it not be better to work this out diplomatically? This isn't a case for diplomacy. It's a case for your acceptance of the situation. It is not just my acceptance at issue, Mr. Carter. Frankly, some of our people are quite upset. Move to take drastic measures if need be. Are you threatening me, you malodorous little man? Mr. Carter, there are some who would rather fight back than allow their country to be stripped of its national treasures. Any fat savage who lays a finger on my exhibit, or threatens me, will find himself in deep trouble. Do I make myself clear? As clear as the water of the oasis, Mr. Carter. with that steamer trunk, young man. It's exceedingly valuable. It sure is heavy, Mr. Carrington. You got gold bars in here or something? The contents of my trunk are not your concern. Now be a good lad and take it to my taxi. The Countess is waiting. One week later. Are you sure you've got everything? Yes, Daddy. You've got Sam's address? Got the paper? Yes, Daddy. You've got the money I gave you? Yes, Daddy. Don't worry. Put some money in your shoe. New York's a big city, and there's a lot of crime there. Look, I'm going straight to the paper. Could possibly go wrong. Let me give you a little more money, just in case. Dad, I've got to go. Godspeed, Laura. Call me as soon as you get there. I'll be fine, Dad. I'm going to make you proud of me. I already am, honey.
Excuse me, dear, are you a secretary? Actually, I'm starting a new job as a reporter for the New York Daily Register News Tribune. My name's Laura Bow. How nice. I'm Ermgard. Is this your first trip to the big city? Am I that obvious? How could you tell? By the way you keep glancing out the window, dear. I did the same thing the first time I came to New York. The tall buildings, the people rushing around, it was all so exciting. Then I stepped off the train and got mugged. How awful! It's the New York experience. Thank you, dear. You're very kind. I've enjoyed traveling with you. Do you need any help getting home? No, dear. I'll be fine. Thank you. You're sure you'll be okay? Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Goodness gracious! My suitcase! Can you spare a dime, miss? Certainly, sir. I'm always ready to help those who are less fortunate. Well, that's just peachy. Give me all your money, then. Excuse me? Hand it over. This seems very unfair. Welcome to New York, kid. Gonna let a little bad luck ruin my day. Hello, New York. Laura Bow has arrived. Destiny awaits. Nothing can stop me now. I really want to thank you for hiring me, Mr. Augustini. For hiring you? I don't even know who you are. I'm Laura Bow. I believe you know my father, John Bow. Ah, oh, John Bow's daughter. Now I remember. How is he? He's fine, and he says hello. He wanted to know if you still had that newspaper clipping on your wall about the explosion of the Hindenburg building in Yarlins. Yes, your father was the first cop on the scene of the explosion, and he let me into the wreckage so I could cover it for the paper. I rescued Rupert Hindenburg from his burning office, wrote about it, and made a name for myself as a reporter. I owe John a lot for that. Think you can handle being a reporter for a big city paper? I'll do my best, sir. We usually just hire men for this job. It's rough out there, and you're kind of small. I can do it, Mr. Augustini. Just give me a chance. All right, as a favor to my old pal, John. But I'll be keeping a close eye on you. Thank you, sir. For your first assignment, I want you to write about a burglary. Some kind of uh, fancy knife was stolen from the Lion Decker Museum. I'll arrange for you to attend the fundraiser at 7 o'clock tonight for their new Egyptian exhibit. Everyone will be there. Tell them you're covering the society news so they won't clam up on you. You won't regret it, sir. I have a nose for news. Just keep your nose out of trouble. Here's your official notebook and your pencil. It already has Crotfaller's notes in it. Have the story ready by 3 tomorrow or you're out of a job.
Laura Baines, right? Laura Bow, sir. And I believe you have the advantage. Crodfaller Rhubarb, ma'am. Though you can call me Rube. So I suppose you've already met Sam. Yes, he's very... colorful. And don't let him shake you. He's tough on the outside, but inside, he's got a heart of stone. I'm sure he... Pardon me? What did you say? Never mind. Just pulling your leg. Why don't you take this desk right here and we'll get you settled in. That's very kind of you. Mr. Augustini sort of left me on my own. I have to start on this story about a burglary at the Lion Decker Museum. It's you, Laura Bow, fresh out of college and already working for a great metropolitan newspaper. You straighten out your dress. Appearances count. You remind yourself of the principles of investigative journalism. Research, observation, diligence and clarity. You ask yourself if you can handle the task set before you, then demonstrate your characteristic pluck by resolving to do your best. This is the city newsroom of the New York Daily Register News Tribune, New York City's second most popular newspaper. It's a beehive of activity, but as you look around the room, you notice with some dismay that all of the employees are male. You can feel the tension in the city newsroom of the New York Daily Register News Tribune. The window overlooks the street, but it's so filthy that it's impossible to see anything clearly. That is, the window is filthy, not the street. Well, the street is filthy too, but it's the filth on the window that makes the filthy street difficult to see. One notice reads, when covering formal events such as embassy parties, please dress appropriately. We've had complaints about reporters who refuse to dress properly at social events. One of the notices reads, Some of our employees have been asking for a 40-hour work week, as has been proposed by Mr. Henry Ford. This is not an automobile factory, this is a newspaper. News happens 24 hours a day and we need to report it. One of the notices reads, Stolen, one Victrola, reward offered, no retribution will be exacted. One of the notices reads, Dr. Darwin DeLoring will be hosting a symposium, Jazz, the Charleston, and other sins of our times, to be held in the cafeteria next Tuesday. All repentant souls are invited to attend. This is the science editor for the Trib. His latest report critiqued Goddard's demonstration of the first liquid fuel rocket which traveled 184 feet in 2.5 seconds. At the moment, he's checking to see who signed up for the three-legged race at the annual picnic. Excuse me, I'm looking at this right now. You may look at it when I'm finished. I'm so excited to be a member of the Trib staff. After all, I studied journalism in college. I went to Tulane and never thought that my first job out of school would be at a paper as prestigious as this one. I mean, that is unusual, isn't it? I'm sorry, were you talking to me? Never mind. I'm busy right now, girlie. Love to help you out sometime, though. Maybe buy you dinner or something. The man poring over a layout is Eddie Bedletter, creator of the syndicated advice column Dear Eddie. Unfortunately, Eddie has been divorced twice and is estranged from his rival columnist brother, so where he gets off giving other people advice on how to live their lives is an unanswerable question. Hey, girly, don't touch the fabric. 
Aren't you Eddie Bedletter, the syndicated columnist? I'm a great fan of yours and I've read... Yeah, yeah. I'm busy right now. Aren't you that rude syndicated columnist I've heard so much about? Yeah, yeah. I'm busy. Get lost. People are filtering in and out of the room constantly. They're apparently hard at work and not one of them stops to give you a second glance. Hands to yourself, please. I'm looking for the women's lounge. Hey, good luck, kiddo. We've never had one. No ladies ever worked at this paper. You couldn't have picked a worse time to ask. The gent's sign leaves little doubt as to what lies behind the door. You shudder to think of it. You can't go in there. That's the men's lounge. You glance around curiously, but there's no sign of a ladies' lounge. This is patently unfair. It's a waste paper basket conveniently situated next to the desk. You find a curiously heavy object in the trash. This baseball has been autographed by Bob Ruth, Babe's unknown younger brother. Bob never made it out of the minor leagues because he was incapable of violence and therefore would not harm a baseball by hitting it with a bat. Bob eventually quit baseball and became a successful psychiatrist. You pick it up and place it in your purse. This is now your desk. It's very old and looks like it hasn't been cleaned thoroughly in years, but it's sturdy and serviceable. It's the first pencil holder you've ever had as an official member of the Fourth Estate. You already have plenty of pencils. This is the top drawer of your desk. The desk drawer is locked. It looks like an old desk blotter. Feels like an old desk blotter. You only find some lint under the desk blotter. You peel up a corner of the blotter to reveal a small key. A common, everyday, ordinary key. Quite dull and boring, actually. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Crodfoller T. Rube Rhubarb is one of the Trib's top writers. Among other things, he's in charge of writing obituaries, yet he's also extremely cheerful. Please, don't touch me, Miss Bow. I hope I'm not intruding. I mean, if you were working on the burglary story. Miss Bo, please, it is not a problem. Yes, I'd started work on the story, but it's not your fault that it's been reassigned. That's just something I'll have to take up with Sam. Thank you, Mr. Crod. I mean, Rube. It must be so thrilling to see your byline on a story. I rarely get a byline on my obituaries. I seem to be pigeonholed on the obit page. I have a feeling 1926 is going to be a great year, don't you? Yeah. You ever try writing obituaries for a living? <laughs> Hardly a jolly way to spend the year. Were you able to get any leads at all about the burglary at the museum? 
No, hadn't been working on the story very long. I went to see Detective O'Reilly down at the police station, but he was pretty tight-lipped. I was planning on talking to Ziggy down at the speakeasy. He's a stoolie, usually good for a tidbit or two. Any other leads I can follow up on? With due respect, ma'am, it's going to be your byline on the story, not mine. Point taken, Mr. Crod for... Rube. Any wisdom you'd care to pass along about Egyptology? You've already proven to me you know as much about Egyptology as I do. Maybe more. I bow to your superior knowledge, Miss Bo. Thank you, sir. Is there anything I should know about working here at the New York Daily Register News Tribune? Well, first of all, we call it the Trib. No need to use the whole name. I don't think anyone in New York even remembers the whole shebang. Second, don't worry about Sam. He's gruff and loud, but he's really a cream puff. Don't let him push you around. Lastly, don't get too attached to any one assignment. You never know when it'll be yanked away from you and given to some less experienced reporter with no qualifications except an in with the boss. Ahem. <clears throat> Sorry. Didn't mean to get peevish. Anything I should know about the police station? Well, it's usually a good source of information. It's standard procedure to check there at some point in any investigation. Sometimes they just blow smoke at you, you know, hand you the commissioner's party line. But once in a while they'll give you something you can actually use. What can you tell me about low fats? It's a place to take your laundry. That's about it, as far as I know. Give me the lowdown on the 12th Street docks. Lowdown? You've been reading too much pulp fiction. The docks are the docks. Keep away from them, unless you have business there. Is there anything I should know about the Lion Decker Museum? Yeah, I went down there. I did get that far in the investigation, at least. I met the museum's president, a stodgy old croaker named Archibald Carrington III. Cagey guy didn't seem overly concerned about the dagger. You might see if you can get a little bit more out of him. I also spoke with a Pippin Carter. Nasty little squirt. He acts like the world owes him a living. Apparently, he's the one who's originally discovered the dagger in Egypt, along with some of the other junk in the exhibit. Now he was hot about the dagger. Took the whole thing like it was a personal stab at him. No pun intended. Where can I find this speakeasy? Just ask any cab driver. They'll take you there. It's the place disguised as a flower shop. Any advice for somebody who's brand new to the city? Well, keep your eyes off the tall buildings. That's how muggers spot you. Don't leave your luggage alone for a moment or somebody will walk off with it. And if you travel anywhere, be sure to put some money in your shoe, just in case. Can you tell me about Sam? He's a perfectionist. I badmouth him now and then, but, well, he's given me plenty of breaks, so I owe him a few. What can you tell me about this Pippin Carter character? A queer bird, if ever I've met one. Kind of comes across as cultured, yet he's a loudmouth, you know what I mean? He's got a chip on his shoulder the size of the Brooklyn Bridge. He'll try to cut you down, just shake it off. 
That's what I had to do. What should I know about Archibald Carrington? Carrington hasn't been in the States long. He's from England, but somehow he doesn't quite come off on the level. Call me stupid, but I just think the guy should be more concerned about museum property vanishing. His first month on the job, too. Have you dealt with Detective O'Reilly? I know he's assigned to the case. I didn't get anything out of him. Maybe you'll have better luck being a lady and all. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Rhubarb. What's to tell? I'm a reporter for this paper, probably since before you were born. But I want to know about the real crowdfaller T. Rhubarb. You mean there's another crowdfaller T. Rhubarb? No two sets of parents could be that cruel. That's okay, Mr. Crowdfaller. You don't have to tell me about yourself if you don't want to. Rube. Who are you calling a... Oh, Rube's your nickname, isn't it? Sorry, I forgot. Tell me about Low Fat. The old laundry guy? What's to tell? Have you heard the name John Bow? Don't think so. He a relative of yours? He's my father. Oh, Sam's friend. Never met him, I'm afraid. Who is Ziggy? He's what we politely call a stool pigeon. Basically, the guy squeals for cash. Amazing that the guy hasn't had his neck broken by now. What should I do with this notebook? You're a reporter, for heaven's sake. Surely you know to take notes. But why does it have all these notes all read in it? Because that was my notebook. And I was taking notes in it for the burglary investigation. It's your notebook now. And I don't care to discuss it anymore. I found this baseball in the trash. What should I do with it? Keep it, I guess. Or give it away. The sports writer who sat at your desk only had about 50 souvenir baseballs. I found this key under my blotter, but I don't know what to do with it. And here I thought you were such a bright young girl. Why not look inside your desk drawer and see if there are any instructions? This is now your desk. You unlock the drawer. Unfortunately, the key permanently jams itself in the lock. Let's hope you never want to lock this drawer again. A press pass. It reads, Press. Your pants while you wait. Low Fats Chinese Laundry, 5858 Broadway Avenue, New York. You pick it up and place it in your purse. What is this? I'm not sure. Hand it to me and I'll take a closer look at it. Oh, this is what we call a press pass. Very useful. We ran out of official press passes. This is a business card for low fats, but if you wave it in front of a cabbie, he'll take you where you want to go. The 
the corner of 75th Street and Madison Avenue, New York City, home of the world-famous New York Daily Register News Tribune building, among other things. It's the exterior of the New York Daily Register News Tribune building. The imposing Gothic entrance to the world-famous New York Daily Register News Tribune. There are no cars coming from this direction. It's the world-famous product design building. The New York home for the mentally bewildered. A woody perennial plant with one main stem or trunk which develops many branches, usually at some height above the ground, otherwise known as a tree. It's a car. Busy New Yorkers on their way to work, ignoring everyone else as they concentrate on putting one foot in front of the other. It's not a good idea to walk up to pedestrians on the street and touch them. They might get the wrong idea. This person is too busy to stop and talk to you. This person is too busy to stop and answer your question. A sign with the word taxi printed on it. This could have numerous meanings. However, since it does not look like a taxi itself, it probably just means that taxis will stop here if summoned. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. It looks like a New York City taxi circa 1926. It feels like a New York City taxi circa 1926. It reads, Taxi Operator's License, New York Taxi Control Authority. The bottom of the license reads, License renewed September 5, 1926. The driver's name is Rocco. The driver is a big, rough-looking guy with a broken nose. Whatever you do, don't touch him. Please, don't touch me, madam. I don't know where you've been. I'm terribly sorry, madam, but the taxi control board doesn't allow me to hold long discussions with passengers except at my own discretion. It's New York City. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? Be careful of the sticky spot on that seat. I'm always taking that six-year-old Asimov kid over to his parents' candy store in Brooklyn. He likes to read science fiction pulps and lick lollipops in the back seat. Intelligent kid, but kind of messy. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. Looking at the mighty cumulonimbus cloud formations in the sky, you're reminded of your childhood, when your father would sit beside you on the grass in front of your house, smelling the scents of summer and looking for familiar shapes among the clouds. When you were a mere tot, you thought you'd be able to touch the sky when you grew up. Now you know better, but your futile attempt makes you wonder if there's still a child somewhere inside you who is dying to get out. Or maybe you've just lost your mind. The famous Liondecker Museum, named after Ignaz Liondecker, who financed the construction of the museum as a tax dodge. Ignaz made his fortune in the late 1800s by defying the banana embargo and smuggling bananas into the country disguised as miniature squash. The exterior of this museum was hand-painted. 
The impressive dome over the museum rotunda. Its shape reminds you of something, but you can't put your finger on it. A marvelous leaded glass window. The entrance to the museum is framed with impressive marble columns. This is exactly the sort of architectural touch that seems so popular these days. It's definitely a tree, possibly a larch. It feels like a tree. The tree has nothing to say to you, but it appreciates your attempt at communication. The tree considers your question, but you're going to die of old age if you choose to wait for a response. A fountain feels like water. The fountain is too busy being a fountain to talk to you. The fountain is too busy fountaining to respond to your question. Steps leading up to the museum entrance. Touching the steps is an interesting experience, but certainly not as fulfilling as climbing them to the museum entrance. This is it, the entrance to the famous Lion Decker Museum. You're so impressed by the entrance to the famous Lion Decker Museum that you can barely restrain yourself from reaching out to touch it. A lovely stained glass window. Exceptionally attractive ionic columns. You see that the fundraising party will begin at 7 p.m. The fabric is soft and silky. A parked car. Note the sleek lines of this late model automobile. Considering that this car is parked right out in front of the museum, it probably belongs to an important staff member, so it's not a good idea to fool around with it. This is the taxi that brought you here. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? I had Al Jolson in this taxi last week. He's starting work on a movie, The Jazz Singer, where you can actually hear people talking. I don't know, I don't think it'll ever replace radio. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. is lying to you, this is the police station. The police department exterior. A very nice fake stone column. The glass seems to be fogged on the inside so that you can't see through it. You could be arrested for leaving fingerprints on the clean glass, so don't touch it. A proud stone lion with a lamp on his head. The fact that he's looking east may indicate that he looks forward to the sunrise each day. Or maybe not. A proud stone lion with a lamp on his head. The fact that he's looking west may indicate that he enjoys watching the colors of the sunset each day. Or maybe not. Feels like a stone lion. Imagine what this lion would say if he could talk. The lion just stares at you. A spotless sidewalk, clean enough to sleep or eat on. A man sleeping under a newspaper. Judging by the strong smell of alcohol, you deem it wise not to light a match in his presence. 
Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Don't bother me, lady. I'm sleeping. He's out cold, but he has a tight grip on his newspaper. He snores in response. The entrance to the police station. This is the inside of the police station. Feels like the inside of the police station. The beautiful mahogany counter serves a dual purpose as desk and a shield. Careful, Sergeant O'Flaherty doesn't take kindly to citizens trying to make off with police property. This support column is also a handy place for posting notices and announcements. Please remember, as of June 15, 1924, all Indians are now full citizens of the USA. Please respect their rights and privileges. Thank you. Let's be careful out there. Why wait? There's never been a better time to invest in the stock market. Civil servants qualify for discount brokerage services at H.R. Schwab, Mary Hill, 3173. Invest in the future of America today. Needed. Volunteer with aeronautic training. Opportunity for co-pilot on first transatlantic flight, Roosevelt Field to Paris, next spring. Contact C. Lindbergh, Hamilton 6656. Tickets to the Policeman's Ball now available. Contact Officer Friendly. Wanted by FBI, Al Capone. Approach with caution. Contact FBI for details. Hey now, keep your hands off of those notices. The door to a private office. You knock politely. You hear the muffled response. Come in. Sure and Bigora, I'm Detective O'Reilly. What would you be wanting then, lass? I'm Laura Bow from the New York Daily Register News Tribune. I'm looking into the burglary at the Lion Decker Museum, and I understand you're handling the case. Would it be possible for me to look at your report? You can't be a reporter, lass. You're a girl. The trip only hires men. I am a reporter, sir, and you can check with my editor, Sam Augustini, if you don't believe me. I thought that Crodfeather guy was going to be writing the robbery article. Crodfather was assigned to it, but the story is mine now. Can I see that report, please? It's very technical, lass. I don't think you'll be learning much from it. Thank you for your concern, Detective, but I'd like to be the judge of that. You're a determined girl. I'll say that much for you. Have a look, then. The file on the Lion Decker Museum burglary is nothing more than a single handwritten page. It mentions only one stolen object. The dagger of Amon Ra. The burglar or burglars left no fingerprints or other clues. Their method of access to the museum is unknown. In summary, the police are baffled about the burglary at the museum at this point. Some parts of the report seem vague. The report is signed by Detective Ryan Hanrahan O'Reilly. There's only one page to this report. Where's the rest of it? That's all of it right now. It's rather vague, isn't it? Good police work takes time, and I'm a very busy man. I haven't had time to follow up on the burglary. So what if a museum loses a knife? There are people being murdered left and right in this city, dropping like flies. Cars are being stolen, booze is being smuggled into speakeasies. Pedestrians are being mugged, firebugs are burning down half the city, they're running out of grapes at the corner market, and I've got a headache. 
And you know who gets to investigate all the crimes in this district? Me! So I don't need any nosy reporters hanging around telling me my reports are vague, girly. Well, excuse me. Talk to the desk sergeant if you have any more questions. I haven't got time for you right now. Sergeant Dennis O'Flaherty is the desk sergeant on duty today. He's shuffling papers, putting on a good show of looking busy while his mind is elsewhere. Dear now, don't be touching the goods, lass. Pardon me, I'm looking for some information. Well, take yourself down to the library then. Pardon me, sergeant, but I happen to be a reporter with the Trib. Oh, well, strike up the barn then. Look, lassie, I've been out with my dogs all day, and I haven't had my lunch. And i got a better things to do than to jaw with some slip of a girl reporter. Go on with you now. Excuse me, but I really need some information. The desk sergeant ignores you, though his stomach growls impatiently. Look, miss, I'm not in the mood to answer any reporter's questions. He must be either a plainclothes detective or a file clerk. Excuse me, sir? Sorry, it's not my precinct. Pardon me, could you tell me? Sorry, I'm just a uh, temporary. That'll be coming in handy for you, miss. So you just hang on to it now. No thanks, lass. I prefer I'm wrestling. I won't be needing one of those, miss. I already got one out of supply. The paper is full of old news and a valuable coupon. A coupon for a free sandwich from Luigi. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Here's a coupon good for a free sandwich. Sorry, miss. If I weren't on duty, this would come in handy. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? Have you heard about that transatlantic radio telephone conversation between New York and London? Imagine hearing someone's voice from that distance. Modern technology, <laughs> it just amazes me. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. the deal with this sandwich coupon? I don't know. Let's see it. Oh yeah, this was from an ad we ran a while back. Don't know if it's still good, but it'll get you a free corned beef sandwich from one of the street vendors. A finely crafted sandwich cart with the name Luigi printed neatly on the side. It feels like a finely crafted sandwich cart. A man selling corned beef sandwiches from a cart. Keep your hands off, lady. 
Hot corn beef, get you hot corn beef sandwich. Is that corn beef, Lean? Lean corn beef. This is the leanest corn beef in the city, maybe in the country. So lean, the cow she keep on tipping over. You wanna buy a corn beef sandwich, lady? I never met a guy. I'm a too busy to meet peoples. I gotta sell these sandwiches. Corn beef sandwiches. Sorry, lady. Never been there. You want a sandwich or not? Hot corn beef sandwich. I don't know about it, lady. Just that I got a nice corn beef sandwich here. Fresh hot corn beef sandwich. You want one or no? What do I look like? The answer, man? I don't know about nothing except the corn beef sandwich, which is what I got right here. I believe I would like a sandwich. Mamma mia, another coupon. I'm gonna go broke. What a crummy idea I had. That's uh, the last time I advertised in a newspaper. Take your sandwich and get out of here before I change my mind. One of Luigi's famous corned beef sandwiches. It's so fresh that it makes a faint mooing sound when you squeeze it. You pick it up and place it in your purse. No thanks. That meat looks too lean for me. I like them fatty and spicy. What do you know about corned beef sandwiches? Nothing. I'm a pastrami man myself. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? Have you read that new book by Carl Sandburg? It's Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years. Actually, it's the first two volumes of a six-volume biography, and I find it quite stimulating reading. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. So hungry. Here, take this. Children is a corned beef sandwich on rye. Bless you, lassie. Don't mind if I do. Children it tastes fresh too. Mmm. I know I always feel a little better after I've had something to eat. There's no denying that, miss. Now what was it you were wanting to ask me? What can you tell me about this police station? 14th precinct, miss, and a darn fine precinct she is, too. What should I know about New York? I've only just moved here. Best advice I can offer you, miss, is to keep some money in your shoe at all times. You never know when you might need some emergency cash. What do you know about the Lion Decker Museum? A very fine establishment. 
worthwhile seeing, even if you're only in town for a short while. Very educational. Have you actually been there? Well... But I live in the city, and I'm not having to see all the landmarks. Are you familiar with the New York Daily Register News Tribune building? Yes, ma'am. And a fine upstanding building it is, too. Have you ever been to Low Fats Chinese Laundry? Not me, miss. But I'll be happy to ask me bunny wife for you. That won't be necessary. I was just asking. What should I know about the 12th Street Docks? Oh, lovely place if you like rats, thieves and roughnecks. If I were you, I'd be staying away from that area. Lord knows we do. What can you tell me about the speakeasy? Now I don't know anything about a speakeasy. Not in this town. We run a clean city here. But there are some nice places where a lady like yourself can sit and relax and enjoy a bit of the high life, if you know what I'm saying. Of course, some of these places are restricted, don't you know? So you'll have to be giving them the right signs so they know they're okay. But just mention a Charleston, and you're in like Flynn. You got that now? I think so. Thank you kindly, Sergeant. Don't mention it. And I mean it now. Don't you go mentioning it. Not to anyone. What does 1926 mean to you? A uh, cut in the department's budget and another year of haggis and blood pudding. No one's just sorry asked. What can you tell me about the burglary at the Lion Decker Museum? I'm not covering that case, miss. Why not ask Detective O'Reilly about it? He's the one you should be talking to. How conversant are you in the intricacies of Egyptology? Missy, I don't even know what you're asking about. What's this business about the Charleston? It's a popular dance last. It's also the you-know-what for the you-know-what I told you about earlier. Is there any information you can give me about Sam Augustini, editor of the New York Daily Register News Tribune? Hoot man, he's a good law-abiding citizen. What do you have on a Pippin Carter? I've never heard of the fella. What do you know of an Archibald Carrington III? Can't say as I've heard of the man, miss. Detective O'Reilly seemed very rude. Is there any way I could talk with him again when he's in a better mood? Ah, well, and here I thought he was in such a good mood today. He's a very busy fella. If only you'd talk to him once today, I doubt he'd be talking to you again. Do you have any record of a crowd fall of T. Rhubarb? Oh, ho, ho, ho. go on with you. You're pulling my leg on that one. There's no such man, is there now? I'm serious. Well, I've seriously never heard of the man. What can you tell me about low fat? Well, it usually doesn't taste as good as the fattening stuff. I'm referring to a person. Oh, well, then I'm afraid I can't give you any information, miss, as I've not heard of the fella. What can you tell me about John Bow? Not much, I'm afraid. I know a lot of men named John Doe, but offhand nobody named John Bow. I'm looking for information about a man named Ziggy. 
What would a lass like yourself be wanting with scum like that? Never you mind why. I'm just looking for information about him. I suppose it's no big secret. Not round here, anyways. Ziggy's is a first-class little rat fink. Couldn't cut it as a crook on his own. Now he has to go around spoiling it for the rest of them. Nasty little big mouth. Though he does seem to hear an awful lot. If you're looking for him, he's the kind of man what hangs around in speakeasies. Not that we have any New York City, mind you. We've got these places closed up good and tight. What do you know about notebooks? They're very handy for taking notes, lass. What do you know about a baseball? I wouldn't want to be getting hit by one. What do you know about press passes? Ah, the bane of my existence, letting the snooping reporters in whether or not wanted. 